Today, we start at the earliest phase of drug discovery and development. That is, deciding on the disease to treat and identifying a specific molecule which, when modulated, is predicted to influence the disease or symptoms. After today's lecture, you should be familiar with all the topics listed here. Drug targets are a key concept in drug discovery, so you must be able to define what a drug target is and you should be able to give examples. You should also become familiar with the factors that affect the choice of disease against which drugs are likely to be developed. Drug targets may be identified in several ways, but you should be able to compare and contrast the more traditional and modern approaches. Historically, there are many examples of drugs being discovered before their targets were known, and targets continue to be identified this way. But today, the main strategy is to research the disease in order to identify particular molecules that might make suitable drug targets. You should also be able to explain how a new drug target is validated and then exploited for drug discovery. At the end of the lecture, I will briefly explain how assays and screens are used to exploit targets. These will be followed up in detail in later lectures. So what exactly is a drug target? It is any molecule that a drug binds to to produce its effect. Proteins are the mediators of most cellular activities, so it should not be a surprise to you that the vast majority of target molecules are proteins. The main proteins that drugs interact with are proteins that you should recognise as being essential players in cell signalling cascades. They are receptors, especially G-protein coupled receptors, enzymes, ion channels and transporters. Increasingly, we are seeing drugs developed which interact with other cellular proteins, including adhesion molecules, structural proteins and gene transcription factors. DNA, RNA and other non-protein molecules can also be targets for drugs. In fact, many new anti-cancer drugs target DNA in some way. Of course, not all drugs are aimed at a human target. Around 17% are aimed at infectious microbes. For example, antibiotics, antimalarials and insecticides. For such drugs to be safe and effective, it is actually essential that they don't interact with human targets. The 10% of miscellaneous drugs includes things like antacids, which have a chemical target to neutralise pH in the stomach, or some laxative drugs, which interact with the contents of the gut rather than the gut itself. Of the human drug targets, they break down as shown in this pie chart. By far, the majority of targets are G-protein coupled receptors or enzymes. The relative numbers of these have varied over the years. At one time, G-protein coupled receptors and other types of receptor represented the main drug target. But in recent years, they have been overtaken by enzymes as the most common drug target. The main enzymes targeted are kinases, which phosphorylate other proteins, and proteases, which break down other proteins. What I've shown you is how common different drug targets are in terms of the numbers of drugs that bind to them. Now I'm going to show you the targets of the most popular drugs, at least as indicated by sales. As much as anything, this reflects the prevalence of the disease being treated. The table here lists the 10 best-selling drugs in 2007. Despite most targets being enzymes, only one of the top-selling drugs acts on an enzyme. Half of the drugs act on G-protein coupled receptors, and most of the others 
act on transporters. Note that all of the drugs listed here are small organic molecules. Up until recently, this was true of almost all drugs. So let's see how the bestseller chart looked seven years later in 2014. The changes between 2007 and 2014 reflect developments in drug discovery that were brought about as a consequence of the introduction of new molecular technologies. Only three drugs on this list are small organic molecules. Only the fluticasone salmeterol drug combination, which is used for asthma, retained its ranking over the seven-year period. As this remained the preferred treatment, it looks like no better drugs were developed for asthma over that period. Resuvastatin, used to treat hyperlipidemia, did not make the top 10 in 2007, although it was available, but it is from the same drug class as atorvastatin, which previously ranked number one. This reflects clinical trials in the intervening period, which demonstrated a better outcome for patients taking resuvastatin so it replaced atorvastatin as the drug of choice. The neuroactive drug, aripiprazole, was a newcomer to the list in 2014, taking 10th spot. It was available for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder well before 2007, but after 2007, its indications were widened to include depression. So more patients had access to it. These drugs are all small organic molecules and target receptors and enzymes. But what of the other drugs on the list? The first thing to notice is that G-protein coupled receptors and enzymes do not feature among the targets of these top selling drugs. That may be because new technologies have now made it possible to interfere specifically with the activities of proteins which proved previously to be poor targets for small organic molecule drugs. These drugs are all large protein molecules known as biologics or biopharmaceuticals. There are two main types of biologic drug and both feature in this list. Humanized antibodies raised against protein targets are increasingly used to treat inflammatory disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease, as well as some cancers. The other type of biologic is a recombinant protein, which is produced by engineering organisms to express the DNA coding for a human protein. In the case of etanercept, the DNA encodes a human tumor necrosis factor alpha receptor coupled to IgG. It binds TNF alpha in the circulation preventing it from acting on the immune system. Insulin glargine is a mutated form of human insulin with a longer duration of action. When looking for a new drug target, it is generally intended for the treatment of a particular disease. There are many factors that influence how the decision is reached and what disease is decided upon. Stakeholders with vested interests in which diseases should be the focus for new treatments can have a large impact on the decisions made. They may lobby for particular diseases and can influence the choice in various ways. For example, they can raise awareness of the need for treatment or provide funding for research into particular diseases. So the global effort to identify new drug targets results from the combined input of all stakeholders. But different drivers tend to influence researchers working in different arenas. The main environments that drug target research takes place in are academic institutions, such as universities or research institutes, or within a pharmaceutical company. In academia, the main drivers for studying a particular disease are usually personal interest in the disease and the funding available to support the research. Most academic researchers have to compete nationally and internationally for funding from external bodies, such as government-based research councils or medical research charities. Since research is expensive, 
academic scientists are strongly influenced by the disease priorities of the funding bodies. But they have access to a wide range of funding sources and are just as likely to search for targets to treat a rare disease as a common disease. In the pharmaceutical industry, choosing the disease target is part of corporate strategy and is not driven by the personal interests of the scientists. A major consideration will be the financial return on any drugs resulting from a project, so they are unlikely to choose a rare disease that affects a small number of patients. Other considerations will be the resources available. These may be financial or existing research infrastructure. They will also be influenced by the number and scope of existing projects. They're more likely to choose a disease area in which they have already invested and had some success. Although they could, for strategic reasons, decide to enter a new disease area. They will also be mindful of the competition from other drug companies. So it may be better to move into a new area with less competition than to expand in a familiar area where there is a lot of competition. Once the disease has been selected, the next step is to research the disease. Nowadays, this usually begins with a genetic study to identify changes in gene sequence or gene expression in healthy versus diseased tissues. It has always involved physiological studies of patients and animal models of the disease where these are available. When the involvement of particular genes has been identified, it is now possible to engineer mice with the genetic defect to provide an animal model. These studies help to identify specific disease pathways. From that, scientists can predict molecules that might be able to alter the disease process when modulated by drugs. The disease research will begin with literature reviews. Drug companies often seek the advice of experts in the field, usually in academia, and they may fund research symposia to gather the world's experts together. After building up knowledge of the disease in this way, information leading to new targets will be sought by further practical research. Which targets they pursue will involve another strategic decision. Do they go for a completely new target? That would give them a new class of drugs with a completely new mechanism of action. By producing the first drug in a class, they have the potential to generate a blockbuster drug that will bring enormous revenue. But if they focus on that target, it might turn out to be an ineffective target. The alternative is to choose a target that has already been identified and proven to be effective by existing drugs. In that case, the strategy would be to find a better drug that would displace the current drug on the market. This would be a best-in-class drug. When selecting drug targets, pharmaceutical companies like to hedge their bets by following up multiple potential targets for a disease. This is known as the disease portfolio. So rather than deciding to aim at a first or best-in-class drug, they are likely to decide to include both options in their portfolio so that if the new target fails, they have a backup. This reduces some of the high risks associated with drug discovery. An example of how a portfolio might work is in cancer chemotherapy, where multiple targets are found in different aspects of tumour maintenance, growth and spread. So targets might include a hormone or a molecule involved in pathways for cytotoxicity, cell cycling, tumour invasion and metastasis. I've given you the general strategy for how drug targets are identified. There are two main approaches, conventional target discovery and the modern molecular approach. The conventional approach was the only option before the human genome was sequenced, but it remains a productive approach today. It involves studying physiological and pathological pathways in human tissues and animal models. It usually also includes the exploitation of existing drugs with known effects in disease, with the aim of understanding how the drugs work. 
For example, one of the oldest drugs, aspirin, was used to treat pain long before we understood how it worked. By studying its actions, the target of aspirin was identified as cyclooxygenase, and that led to the development of a series of new cyclooxygenase inhibitors. The modern molecular approach is what I described on the previous slide, and it now dominates target discovery programs. It is driven by our new knowledge of gene sequences and molecular technologies, which include genomics, proteomics, transgenic animals, and gene manipulation in cells and tissues. Some of these will be explained later in the lecture. The molecular technologies used today in target discovery were made possible by the Human Genome Project, which had sequenced the entire human genome by 2003, a major milestone in the life sciences. Although genome sequencing was the main objective of the project, it was realised early on that new technologies would be needed to handle the large amounts of data that would be produced. So alongside DNA sequencing, the project had the additional goals listed here, which led to the development of modern genomics, proteomics and informatics. The rest of the lecture focuses on molecular approaches to target discovery. This strategy starts by isolating human DNA from patients and healthy subjects. The DNA sequences are compared to look for differences in gene sequences that might indicate disease-related mutations or expression patterns that might indicate altered protein expression associated with disease. The effects of genetic differences can be tested by replicating them in mice. If the genes are important in disease, this could lead to a mouse model of the disease. At this point, you have identified possible targets, but have no information on their role in the disease or what mechanisms lead to the changes seen. Studies on mouse models, which are not feasible in humans, can then help to uncover new signalling pathways involved in the development of the disease. This knowledge can suggest new targets. Molecular approaches to target discovery were made possible by the availability of several technologies. A key technology is genomics, which is basically a method for the rapid extraction and sequencing of DNA. It also includes recombinant DNA, or DNA that is made in the laboratory and can be expressed in cells or used to genetically engineer animals. Bioinformatics is another technology closely associated with genomics. It is a means for storing, handling and retrieving large amounts of data which are generated with genomic approaches. The main limitation of genomics is that it only tells you about gene sequences, not the related proteins, which are the mediators of activity in the cell. It also only tells you about individual sequences and gives no clue about the pathways the expressed protein might be involved in. So another key technology is proteomics, which involves the extraction, isolation and identification of proteins, as well as the measurement of protein expression and interactions with other proteins. Proteomics involves extracting protein from tissues, separating them by two-dimensional electrophoresis, excising the isolated proteins from the gel and identifying their sequences. Some functional properties of the isolated proteins can also be assessed. Proteomics also has limitations for target discovery. A major problem lies in purifying enough of the individual protein. A protein might play an important role in disease progression, but if it is expressed at a low level, it might not be detected. Many proteins undergo post-translational modifications, such as those listed here. These modifications may affect the function of the protein, and just knowing its sequence provides no information on these effects. Genetic association is a technology for comparing the genes from different populations. It is used to look for mutations which can cause severe or serious disease, such as cystic fibrosis, Huntington's chorea, 
Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and inherited cardiac arrhythmias. These diseases were known to be genetically determined before the human genome was sequenced, but we now know exactly what causes them. But we also now know that altered gene sequences or gene expression may be responsible for more common diseases, or at least they contribute to a wide range of common disorders. So modern target discovery programs begin by comparing gene expression in healthy and diseased human tissues. This slide illustrates the link between a gene and its effect on the body in a healthy subject. Expression of the gene leads to expression of a protein. The express protein has a function which results in particular characteristics known as the phenotype. Now let's look at the pathway when the gene is altered in disease. The altered gene gives rise to an altered protein or altered expression of the protein, which is dysfunctional. This gives rise to the disease phenotype. But there are consequences to the dysfunction. In response, a cell will often change the expression of other proteins, which may act as a compensatory feedback to limit the disease or as reinforcement that adds to the dysfunction. The consequence is that the expression of many genes may be altered as a result of one disease gene. When you measure gene expression, you detect all the changes in expression. Some genes may be upregulated, others downregulated. The question then becomes, are all these genes potential new targets? The answer is no. The altered expression of a gene may be because it drives the disease process, but it could be a consequence of the disease, not the cause. So the challenge is to identify which changes represent the drivers of disease and hence are relevant targets. Additional information is needed. This may come from physiological and pharmacological experiments or genetic engineering experiments. So the reality of target discovery today is that molecular technologies have opened up new routes for discovery with the potential to generate lots of data. But within that data, there may be only a few relevant pieces of information and the challenge is to sift through that information and identify what is important. Whatever the strategy used to identify new drug targets, the key is good biological intelligence, which requires understanding of the biological system and the disease process. Identification of a drug target is not complete until it has been validated. Many potential targets have been identified only to fail to produce the anticipated effect in vivo. So before beginning the search for drugs aimed at the target, it is essential to validate it as best you can. That involves checking that the gene expressing the protein target is expressed in the appropriate tissues then confirming that the protein is expressed in the right place too, and it has the appropriate function in the tissue. Transgenic techniques are used to check that deleting or overexpressing the gene has the effects predicted. Lastly, an initial screen for compounds that interact with the target can be used to test if chemical modulation of the target has the predicted effects in cellular preparations and in vivo. Once you have validated a target, it can then be exploited in the search for new drugs. That requires a series of assays and screens, which you will hear about in later lectures. It is important that you know what these are and how an assay differs from a screen. An assay is developed to provide a method for measuring the biological activity of a target. A typical assay might measure the binding of a drug to a receptor, or the activity of an enzyme, or the level of secretion, contraction, or changes in cell calcium ion concentration. 
Each one of these measures would be an individual assay. A screen uses assays to measure the activity of test compounds at a target, not the target itself. It might, for example, measure the ability of compounds to interfere with drug receptor binding, or to interfere with enzyme activity, or a functional response. I have mentioned informatics a few times, and you will come across the term again. So before I finish, I thought I'd better explain exactly what that means. Informatics are computer-based technologies for understanding and exploiting large, complex sets of data. These technologies are crucial for target discovery and for lead generation because in both cases, very large amounts of data can be generated. Data can come in many forms, including gene and protein sequences and expression profiles, numerical data from compound screening, and clinical data. The science of informatics is addressing not just the storage of large data sets, but also how we can analyse and visualise the data in a user-friendly way. The final slide summarises the target discovery step of drug discovery. It is the first step and aims to identify a novel molecule in a biochemical pathway which, when modulated appropriately, is predicted to prevent or alleviate disease. Once identified, a target must be validated. This means verifying the link between the target and the disease. Evidence must be gathered to show that modulating the target has the predicted effect. Target validation is very important because getting it wrong at such an early stage of drug discovery can result in failure of drugs later in the process and can be very costly. However, no matter how thoroughly the target is validated, it is never 100% validated until the desired effect is seen in human patients.